Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it. Thank you. It's being written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of covenants, and we've been talking about New Testament conditions and promises. God wants to bring forth all the promises, and we are to possess them all, remember. We're not to be thinking that we're going to come short of any. We're to possess every one. But we have to meet all the conditions. So we have to know the conditions and know the promises and then do what God says so He will bring forth those promises in our life. We again see in Hebrews 8, 6, Now has He obtained a more excellent ministry, speaking of Jesus, by how much also He's the mediator of a better covenant, the New Testament, which is established upon better promises. We are not under the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament has been taken away in order that He might establish the second, and He has brought that into being. We've been going through Hebrews, and we're going to be talking especially many scriptures regarding faith that is important for you to understand for conditions that are necessary for you to really have the true faith and see it work in your life. First of all, though, one scripture that we didn't look at prior to coming to Hebrews was in Philemon, verse 6, because this deals with faith. It says that the communication, and this really means the participation in this sense, of your faith may become effectual. Now when it says may become, this again, as we've talked about the fact that we have subjunctive mood verbs that are conditional statements or the conditions that have to be met, and also the if and then statements that show the conditions to be met, as well as just direct commands and sayings that are telling us what to do. So here, it's talking about that this participation of our faith may, might become effectual, active. This is the Greek word energes, meaning it's going to be active or and be an operative, because this word here comes from a word that means to work, ergon. So it means to become active and operating effectively, working effectively, in the not acknowledging. This is not a participle which would be translated with an ing. It should not be translated that way. Instead, it is a noun. Here is in the Greek text, and this is the word, which is a noun. Because it's a noun, it would not be translated with an ing. Why they translate it is beyond me, and many translations have done this. Instead, it might become factual and op operative in the precise correct knowledge is what this word means as a noun, in the precise correct knowledge of every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. And these are all the things that have come into you through what Jesus Christ has accomplished for you. So we need to get the exact, precise, correct knowledge of everything that belongs to us, all the promises of God, and our faith is going to become active and operative and effectual to bring those into being. So this is speaking about your faith is to be participating in an active, operative way. So you see, all these things come to pass. In order to do this, we must understand clearly about faith. First of all, when you get born from above, you get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. But you also have to understand, 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith. Well, if we all have the same spirit of faith, since we have the same spirit of Christ, that tells us that the spirit of faith came into us at the same time when we got born from above. You have a general spirit of faith. It's the same spirit of faith. According as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. This is telling you what you do to put your spirit of faith in operation. We also believe and therefore speak. And when it speaks here, I have believed is talking about the past, but when it says we also believe, this is talking about what we do in the New Testament ongoingly with the present tense, which means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. We also continually believe and therefore, what do we do to put it in operation? We continually speak with the present tense denoting the ongoing action of speaking. So here's our general spirit of faith. 
Now, how do we put our general spirit of faith in operation? Remember, it has to do with the precise, correct knowledge of every good thing in us, which is going to be all the scripture, scriptural promises. And so what happens as we hear the word on those scriptural promises? That word brings specific faith into us as the word comes into our heart. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by this word of God, which is the rainbow, the spoken word of God. As you hear it, it, the word is being sown in your heart and in your mind, remember. And as you hear it in your mind, it's producing hope in your heart, it's producing faith. And so this tells us two things. One, we have a general spirit of faith. Two, we get specific faith as we hear the word. What are we to do? We're to put our spirit of faith in operation by mixing it with that general spirit of faith of the scripture that we have received by putting it in operation, which is what we've seen already in Hebrews chapter 4. We mix our faith with the word that we heard. Remember Hebrews 4.1? These are all subjunctive mood verbs. May we fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest that any of you might think, not seem, that you might think, this is what this is really talking about, you might be thinking on any ongoing basis, subjunctive mood, to come short of it. We're not to come short of any promise. God wants you to possess all the promises, and as you possess them all, that's how you enter into his rest. While you're still working on possessing promises, you're on the road to entering into his rest. When you come to the place where your work is done, then you have accomplished that. And how is this going to happen? Through your faith mixed with that word. Look what it says, though, in verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached. They heard the word, so specific faith came to them through hearing the word, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. It does not automatically produce results in your life unless you do what needs to be done. Even though it produced faith because you heard it, nonetheless, you have to mix it with faith in them that heard it. What faith? Your general spirit of faith by believing it and speaking it or acting upon it, doing what it says. That is important if you are going to see the promises of God come to pass in your life. Now, another thing that we saw already, but we'll just bring it up again. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. Remember, we're to have, we get the doctrine established in us, and that is of paramount importance, so we're not believing things that are contrary to the truth. We cannot have any false doctrine in us. Then, once that happens, we are now able to go on to perfection. And this, again, remember, is a subjunctive mood verb. May we continually, present tense, be going on to perfection, which is what God is taking us all into. And notice he said, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. These are foundational principles that have to be established first. And one of those also was faith towards God, meaning we have to get ourselves established in faith, operating our faith, working our faith, possessing the promises of God, conquering and overcoming the world, the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith, and using your faith to overcome every work of the devil, casting out the demons, resisting, speaking to mountains, whatever it might be. It's all going to be done through your general spirit of faith that you mix with the specific word, putting it in operation. So that's, until that happens, we haven't got the foundation laid. So that's important to get this foundation laid. Now, remember that the promises of God are to be possessed as part of our inheritance. And Hebrews 6.12, we saw where we're not to be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and this word patience is the Greek word makrothumia, which means long-suffering. Why long-suffering? Because while our faith applied, we're suffering long in the face of the circumstances that haven't changed until they do. You keep your faith applied. And you don't give up or throw in the towel or draw back. You continue on with that, that fruit of long suffering. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And then it says you are inheriting the promises. Not that you already inherit them. Present tense, you are inheriting the promises, showing that it is ongoing work 
for you to be possessing your inheritance. Remember, we are going about to possess our salvation. We're going about to possess the promises of God. And as we do what the Word says, we're putting our faith in operation with long suffering, we are inheriting the promises of God. Now, another thing that we looked at in, Gen in Hebrews 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart. We must have a true heart, a right heart, in full assurance, which means most certain confidence of faith. You've got to understand your faith will bring you victory, and you're to have most certain confidence of faith. Your faith will always bring forth victory when you put it in operation and meet all of the conditions. It will not fail unless you don't do what's necessary. It could fail if you don't do what needs to be done. But your faith is the faith of Jesus, and it will bring forth victory. And then we see in verse 23 what we're to do. Let us hold fast. This again, we've seen before, it's a subjunctive mood verb, meaning a conditional statement. It is the present tense, meaning let us be continually holding fast. The profession, homologio, profession or confession, saying, speaking with our mouth, of not our faith, this is an error in the King James, ours not even there, and faith is not the word pistis, which is the word for faith, it is the word elpis. This particular word means hope, translated hope 53 of the 54 times. So it's the holding, the holding fast of the confession of our hope. The confession of our hope is a release of our faith because we get hope in us, we know what the word is, and we speak it, which is putting our faith in operation. Without wavering, meaning firm, unmoved, nothing is going to cause you to ever draw back. And you shouldn't. For he is faithful that promised. God's faithful. He promised it. He's going to perform it. Remember, God swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. He made an oath. He would carry out exactly what he says. That's important. Another thing we saw over in verse 38. The just shall live by faith. This is the way you live. But notice it's the righteous. You've got to be a righteous one. You can't be walking in unrighteousness. You aren't going to be operating by faith because you're, you're not right with God. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, remember, if you're not operating and walking in His ways. So you've got to be righteous, and you're going to be living by faith. If any man would draw back, that means he's not operating in faith. He says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God will not be pleased with you. And you'll find out that you haven't met a condition for your faith to do anything in your life. It's, you're going to be instead drawing back into perdition. We're not of them who draw back into perdition, which is destruction. You're to walk by faith. It's a command to every one of us. But of them that believe, or not really, but the word, this is the word pistis, which means of faith. But were those who are, are of faith it's not a verb, it's of faith. Well, we're of faith to the preservation. Saving really means the preservation of the soul. Because if you're walking by faith, you're operating in the Spirit, and you're going to be doing what's right. If you're not, you're going to be walking in sin, and your soul is going to be taken down by the attacks of the enemy and the destruction that you're allowing because you're not walking by faith. That's why we cannot be ever drawing back from walking by faith. It is absolutely essential. Now, we're going on to Hebrews chapter 11 now. In Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> so we've seen many conditions here already. But we're going to see more that are revealed in the statements that are made. Now, faith is the substance. And when we talk about substance, this is the word hypostasis, which means stasis from stand. Hupo means under. So it's something that's standing under or underlying something. And this refers to the underlying reality or the firm guarantee, an underlying support as such. Faith is that underlying reality and support of the things hoped for. Otherwise, when you have hope, which is from the word in your mind, your faith will absolutely bring it into manifestation when you begin to put it in operation. And what else is it? It is the evidence of things not seen. When it speaks about evidence, this means the proof. It's the proof. You have the faith of Jesus Christ, and your faith is to be put in operation. It is the proof of the things not seen, because where are the promises? They're in the New Testament. Do we see them? No. 
They're from the Word of God that's in the New Testament, reserved in heaven for us. And so we are taking hold of all the things in the unseen realm. Remember what it says back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 18. While we look not at the things that are seen in the natural realm, but at the things which are not seen. Otherwise, because we're taking aim at the things that are in the realm of the Spirit. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. You and I are tapping into the things of the Spirit that are not seen. So that's going to be an important condition. If you are going to see your faith produce and see the promises of God come to pass, you must, of course, have hope, confident expectancy, and you must understand you're dealing with an unseen realm, and you are going to take hold of all the promises that you have to know they're not seen, so don't expect your, your barometer of faith is not, well, I don't see it, you know, thinking that you have faith if you start seeing something. No, faith was, is not dealing with the seen realm. Once it has been manifest, it has come to pass. Your faith has already accomplished that work, and it will be seen in the seen realm. But it's that while your faith is operating, it has nothing to do with the seen realm whatsoever. And then it says, for by it the elders obtained a good report, or literally it says here that they were testified or witnessed that they were walking right. This is a passive voice indicating that they were testified of or witnessed of that they had operated in, and that's what you have to do. See, God's a God who's going to function and every, he functioned everything by faith, and you're going to function in everything by faith. And the way you're going to possess your promises and, and see all these things that you'll see as we go through this list, it's always going to be with your faith. These are all conditions for you to have the real, true faith that's going to produce victory for you. Through faith, we understand, or this means to perceive with the mind is the word. It's not the word for understanding. It's the word noeo, which means perceive of the mind that the ages, this is the word for ages, not worlds, aeon, the ages here were framed, or this really means that they were put in order and arranged, and they were completed and perfected. That's what God always does, of course. He put them in order, He arranged them, He were prepared, they were brought to completion and perfection. Everything God did was perfect, you know by the spoken word of God. What does that mean? God was putting his faith in operation because the spoken word is how you release your faith, remember? You believe and then you speak. That's how. So God, God operates with his faith. He operated with his faith to bring everything into being. You and I do the very same thing. This is how you're going to bring everything into being with your faith. You are going to be speaking things. So you've got to have the word in you. You believe it, therefore you speak. That is putting your general spirit of faith in operation. So the things which are seen in the seen realm did not become or come to pass of things which do appear. Everything in the seen realm has come from a realm that you do not see. That's why the same thing is true. For you to see your healing, you're going to speak it in being, take hold of it from the unseen realm. For you to get delivered of problems, you're going to be casting out the demons from, from the unseen realm. You're going to be using your authority. When you speak to a mountain to be removed, you're going to be doing the same thing. You're going to be speaking to it. Do not be trying to figure things out by the natural. You speak the Word of God and put it in operation, and in the unseen realm, it will produce the results. Always. The things that God brings forth, this always starts out in the unseen realm. You speak things, it'll bring things into being in the seen realm. That is the way faith operates. So you're going to speak things into being. Remember what it says back over in Romans chapter 4. Same principle, Abraham speaking here about him, where he says, as it's written in Romans 4, 17, I've made thee a father of many nations before him who be believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Unfortunately, this translation has deceived many in the body of Christ because there's an error here. First of all, the word calleth shows the ongoing action of your faith. Present tense, continually calling, continually speaking, whatever it might be. Those things which be not, that are not being, <clears throat> they're not occurring. And that would, of course, be a present tense. 
because it's talking about something that's not being or not occurring. As though they were, this has given rise to the false teaching, which is really common in word of faith circles, that things are already done. Otherwise, that I call something that's not happening as though it already was. Example, I declare that I'm already healed. That's what people say. I'm already healed because I'm supposed to call those things as though they already were. That's error. That's actually a lie. <laughs> if, you if you're not healed, you're saying you already are. It's a lie. That's not faith whatsoever. What does this word were? See, this word is the word that means being. And this is the next word, and it happens to be the exact same word, and it also means being. Why did they translate it were? Who knows? It's totally wrong. We'll even show you in the Greek. You may not know Greek, but you can see this. Here's the last two words here. This is the one word, being. The word be, present tense. And then here's the next word, the last word that was translated were. It's the same word, be in the present tense. Notice even, look at it. This is what, an o, what looks like an O is called the Omicron. This is a, looks like a crooked V, but it's a new, it's an N sound. That's a ta, and this is an alpha. Look over here, it's the exact same word. It's got the same breathing mark and accent over the Omicron, over the O. It's the exact same word. So how can it be one word, be and the other were? It's a terrible problem because many people have thought that this is what I'm supposed to do, and they, you hear them all the time. I'm calling those things, they're being as though they already were done. <laughs> That's not what you do. You call those things not being as being. Otherwise, they're not being, but I'm gonna call them into being by speaking them into being to bring them into being. For instance, if I'm coming to take hold of mercy, I'm going to come boldly and take hold of mercy, and I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I take hold of your mercy, and I thank you that mercy is flowing into me or occurring in my life now. I'm declaring it is happening, or healing. I take hold of your healing power, and I thank you that your healing power is flowing into my body right now. That is taking hold of it to release it to come into being, speaking it into being. That's what you should be, not as though I'm already healed. That's a mistake. The scriptures that talk about the past tense scriptures, like by his stripes you were healed, is talking about what Jesus Christ did for us so that now the promise belongs to us. It's not what we speak to bring things into being. We speak in the present tense declaration of what he's doing for us that brings things into being. That is important to realize. That's why you see in all the places, he was, you speak things into being, present tense, to see things come to pass. So we go back to Hebrews. This is important. If you're going to see the promises of God come to pass, you get the promise of God, and then you make sure, of course, you're righteous, and then you take hold of it and speak it into being, declaring what God is doing for you now. Or you speak it into being, whatever, whatever it is. When you're casting out demons, you command those demons to come out. Not that they've already. You're commanding them now to come out. Or when you're speaking to a mountain, the same thing. You're speaking to it to it to be removed, and you're continually speaking to it, not just one time. We ought to show you, if you've never seen this before, in Mark chapter 11, which is important to understand. And again, this is major error that has been put forth, unfortunately, by those who have not examined the Greek text properly. Or maybe they didn't examine it at all. Mark 11, 23, For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. You're spe speaking a commanding statement to the mountain. Shall not doubt in his heart. You've got to believe what you're saying. But shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Now, what are we saying? We're commanding the mountain to be removed, cast in the sea. We're to believe that. And we're believe that those things which you say, does that mean because I said it once that it's going to happen? We have to put the cursor over the word say it to see what kind of a tense it is. It is a present tense, meaning believe those things which you are saying and continuing to say, not just one time. The one time teaching is great error. And then when it says shall come to pass, does that mean it shall come to pass? That would be a future tense, wouldn't it? When I put the cursor over this, this is the word ginemai, which means come, become or come to pass. Notice what tense it is. 
it's the middle, it's the present tense again. Meaning, what do you do? You're believing those, you shall, shall believe that those things which you are saying continuously are coming to pass continuously. That's what it says in the Greek. Meaning, you're speaking, every time you speak to that mountain, it's happening. It's happening, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening because your faith is always released. Faith is always released now. You keep speaking it and keep speaking it and keep speaking it until it comes into manifestation. That's why all these scriptures are all present tense, holding fast your confession, calling those things not being as being, speaking continually, saying over and over continually to the mountain because what are you doing? You're putting your faith in operation continually until you see the results. That's why, of course, you have to have long suffering as well. And that is important. And while we're here, we ought to look for a moment at verse 24, which is another one that trips people up. Mark 11, 24, Therefore I say unto you, what things whoever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. Every one of these verbs are present tense. First of all, the word desire is the word iteo. And if you haven't seen this, we ought to show you so you understand this very clearly. In the Greek, you must look up these words. The word desire is the Greek word, iteo, number 154 in the Strong's numbering system. It is normally translated ask. This doesn't mean ask, though, because there's, a di there's two different main words for ask. This is the word number 154. Look at it right there, which is strictly a demand of something due. Why am I making a demand of something due? Because we're in a covenant relationship and all the promises of God are our legal rights according to covenant. And because the covenant promises have already been given to us, we're making a legal spiritual demand according to covenant law and the covenant is a legal document. It's already been given to us. Have all the promises already, yes, yea and amen, yes. Have we already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, yes. Then why would we be asking God to give us something if he already gave it to us? There's no reason to. It's error. That's why there's a change from the word, the word for ask. There's two different Greek words for ask. And this is the word, I tell you, making a demand of what's due us. Now, the other thing you have to notice is, when we put this here, it notice. See, the teaching out there has been you pray the prayer of faith one time, believe you receive, and it's done, and it's so. And that's it. That's not true. Present tense. Whatsoever you make a demand to what's due you ongoingly. When you pray, not just one time, present tense, ongoingly, praying continually, believe continually, present tense, that you lambano, which means to take hold of, receive. And what is that? Does that mean like I've already got it one time? No, that's also present tense. I mean, you continually are speaking this into being as you're taking hold of it. I believe that I receive your healing power. I thank you for your healing power that is flowing into me. I take hold of your healing power. You keep speaking it into being, holding fast your confession, to bring it into being, and that's how you're going to see things come into mass, manifestation. This is critical because if you're going to possess the promises, you've got to function in faith. If you don't keep speaking and, or commanding or calling things into being or you know, whatever it might be, is your faith going to produce the results? No. You keep on working your faith until the results are so, and they will come to pass. This brings us to the next point. And all these are so important. Hebrews 11, verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Why was he righteous? Because he obeyed God and did the right thing. What did he do? He brought the tithe, remember, the firstlings of the flock, which was the tithe, the first of the tenth, the tenth one of the flock, which is the tithe, God testifying his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. Otherwise, he did what was right. He brought the tithe. That shows he was righteous. Cain did not. He just brought an offering, and he was unrighteous. He did not obey what God told him to do. This means if you're going to see your faith work to possess your promises and meet the conditions, you've got to be righteous. And you certainly can't be not being a tither. 
Because remember, the tithe is holy. The tithe belongs to him. The first tenth is his. Therefore, if we don't bring that tithe to him, you've robbed God. You've robbed the whole nation. And are you, the Bible says you're cursed with a curse. We've done teaching on tithing extensively, showing the fact that we are cursed with a curse. And by the way, anybody that thinks it's under the Old Testament is an error. We saw that last time, Hebrews 7, 8. Here, the men that die receive tithes, there, of whom it witness that he liveth, receive of them, speaking of Jesus in heaven, who receives it simultaneously at the very same time. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, but was found because, was not found because God had translated him, that for before his translation, what's the, what's, what was the reason why he was able to get translated? He had this testimony that he pleased God. And this is interesting. It wasn't like he suddenly displeased God. Perfect tense means completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking. This means this God, God, uh, Enoch can please God in the past and continually was pleasing him, and that's the way he always was, pleasing him. That's the way you and I are to be. You're to please God every day of your life in everything that you do by walking in his ways and being obedient. By the way, when he was translated, a lot of people think he went to heaven. Could any man go to heaven before Jesus? No. He went to hell. But what happened? He just didn't have physical death. Everybody in the Old Testament had to go to hell, remember? All of them did. And you must understand that, as it says here, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. And we see the fact over here, he speaks in verse 13, No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Well, Enoch was before Jesus came on the scene, yet he didn't ascend up to heaven. Nobody did. Elijah didn't go to heaven. They just didn't taste death. They had to go to hell because nobody was, had a new spirit yet. And they were in the upper compartment of hell for the righteous ones, Abraham's bosom, and then they, of course, heard the gospel and received Jesus and came out of there. But that's what they had to do. At the same time, notice that he pleased God. And what's the mark of you showing that you please God? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4.1. This is one of the scriptures. We saw this before. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, as you have received of us how you must and it's necessary to walk and to please God. It's necessary. So you would abound more and more. You're to be abounding more and more. And then he says, how you know what you're doing, how you know you're pleasing God. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. It's because you obey the commands of the New Testament. Can you please God and not obey the commands of the New Testament? No. You're responsible to know the commands and to keep the commands and obey them and carry them out. So this is another key. If you're going to see your faith work, to possess all the promises, and see God bring forth everything, purpose, purposes for in your life, entering into his rest, you're going to have to please God. And he had pleased God in the past. Otherwise, it's time to please God from today on so you have a track record and it shows you're the real deal, that you're going to please him because you're going to walk in the commandments of God and you're going to do all the things that he tells you to do. That is the way we are going to live. Now, in verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Are you going to be with God if you're not going to please him? <laughs> if it's impossible to please him without faith, that means if you don't have, operate in faith, you're not going to be able to be with him. It is mandatory to operate in faith, which is just simply doing what his word says, operating in the unseen realm. For he that cometh to God, which is what we do, we're drawing nigh to him, must believe that he is. You can't ever doubt for a minute that he, who he is and what, that he does exist, but also that he's a rewarder of those who diligently are seeking him. You and I are to be seeking him. This is another aspect showing that you are really operating in faith. You're seeking him. God wants you to be seeking him. If you just try to take hold of a promise, but you're not seeking him to walk in all of his ways, are you really following him and pleasing him? No. We need to be seeking him. 
You seek the first of the kingdom. You seek his righteousness. You seek all the things it says that we're supposed to seek. Seek peace. Seek all these different things. We're to be seeking him and putting him first place in our life. That's another point, another condition for you. Seek him diligently. And then, of course, what's going to be the result? You're going to be rewarded. You're going to see the rewards come to pass that God will bring. Verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. You know, a lot of these things also are not only what happened then, but they're also prophetic for the end times, too. Warned of God of things not seen yet. Otherwise, judgment's going to come. You've got to make an ark, so you're going to be protected here. We know what's coming, that judgments are coming. So what are we going to do? We're warned of God that we're going to prepare ourselves, so we're going to be ready to overcome what else is coming. He moved with fear, the fear of God before him. What did he do? He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. It's very interesting when we talk about this, this uh, preparing this ark, this is what God wants every one of us to do. Because this word here, again, preparing this, this is a word which is referring to um, making ready. And it's interesting that it actually it has this word kata, you cause you zadzo, and this particular word comes from a word which means vessel. Vessel. So it's talking about preparing like a vessel. Well, what are you and I? We are vessels, and we're to be vessels prepared, vessels of honor, having been sanctified, having been cleansed, having been prepared for every good work. This is all, and what it was to the saving or preserving of his house, well, it's the same thing. You want to get preserved and pre saved and pre be prepared for the things that are coming? Well, you've got to be ready that you're going to have already done what's necessary because we're all warned of God of what's coming, and we have to have the fear of God. We're to live in the fear of God all the time, knowing if we're walking in sin, we're going to have judgment. That's a covenant statement. And so, just as he prepared an ark, that place, to the, to, for the, the saving of his house, in like manner, we're going to do it to the saving of us. Because we're the spiritual house of God. That's why we have to build the spiritual house of God, by which he condemned the world. If you're building the spiritual house of God, and you're preparing everything and making everything ready, walking in the ways of the Lord, you are condemning the world. You're not going to have nothing to do with the ways of the world any longer. And notice, he became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. All because he did what God wanted. Notice, when you're operating in faith, it's not just believing, it's obeying and doing what God wants you to do. That's what he expects. You're going to be, you're being, well, everyone's being warned in this day and age when they're listening to the truth of the word of the things that are coming. Things that are not seen yet, but they're coming. And therefore, we're going to have the fear of God and we're going to prepare our spiritual house. We're going to prepare us so that for a preserving of our house. And we do condemn the world because we're not of this world. We know this world is not of the Father. All in the world's not of him whatsoever. And so what did he do? He obeyed. By faith Abraham, by faith Abraham also, this speaking to him, he obeyed when he was called out to go into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance. He obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Obedience. He says he's going out to receive for inheritance, and yet he said he, he just obeyed, just going forth. That's what you and I need to do. We're going to walk by faith. We're going to do everything that God says. And then it's interesting when we come to the next part here. In verse 9, by faith he sojourned, it says. This is really not the best word because this is a word which simply means dwell beside. It does mean that. Okay, oh, dwell, and para would be beside or dwell near. He dwelt beside. This is also shows us prophetically what's ha going to happen here. Dwell beside in the, it says the land. This is the word gay. It is translated earth 188 times. That's very interesting. He's dwelling besides here who? 
all the people that are in the earth. In the earth of promise. What's the earth of promise? It's been promised for us, remember? It was promised to Abraham he'd be the heir of the world. The earth is a promise to be for us that we're going to take it back, remember? With Jesus, we're going to be ruling and reigning in it. And Jesus is going to take back the earth because it's not under his control anymore. And look what it says after this. Not in a strange country. There's no word for strange and there's no word for country. I put the cursor over, you see this? What does it mean? It's the word mean belonging to another. Oh. What's, what's belonging to another? The earth. Who's it belong to? The devil. How did the devil get it? Because Adam gave it over into his hands, remember? He has, that's why Satan's been ruling over this earth. This literally says he's dwelling here with these, all these ones in the earth of promise. Belonging to another. It's not for long though. Dwelling in the tabernacles, and this is skene, like a tent. That's not a permanent place, is it? That's a temporary place. Because we're, de we're dwelling in what? Temporary places. Your body is a temporary place. It is not where you're going to be. It's only temporary. Because you're going to get a new body. You're going to get a glorified body with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. The same promise, what's that promise? That promise is about the earth, the promise of the earth. And that is the promise to retake the earth. Jesus is going to do it. You and I are going to be in that same position of ruling and reigning in the earth, in the millennial reign. And when all the ones who have been in the, following the devil are going to be destroyed and of course the, the enemy Satan is going to be cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. It's very interesting. The key I think is looking at this strange country it means belonging to another. Well that's talking about the devil who's had control over the earth but his day is coming to an end of him being able to rule and reign. So there's a, this is a promise, when you think about it, to all of God's people that God's going to retake the earth because it's the same promise to every one of us. He's going to do it. And you and I are going to see the realization of having this promise come to pass. It's the same promise to all, all of mankind who will receive Jesus and walk in his ways. Verse 10, For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. <clears throat> He's looking for something else. And it's interesting, it doesn't say a city. It says here about uh, the, the city here having, or it does say, I'm sorry, it does say, it's this, no, it says the city. Let's see where it's at. Yeah, here it is, this. The, and here's the word down here over city. This, this, mall, this is the word, the, ana, the uh, definite article in the feminine singular. And the way you know it has that, this is the way they do things in Greek. It has to have the same case and number. And here is the word for city with the same case and number. So it's talking about the city of those having, or ha or having, those, those having the foundation. This is where it's having the foundation. So literally it says he's looking for the city having the foundations. <laughs> Not just some city. What's the city? Ah, the city is when we're going to see uh, eventually the new heavens and the new earth, but also the city whose builder and maker is God. It's also interesting that this also can be pointing towards the holy church, the holy nation, that being seeing the work of God done because the builder refers to one who is like a craftsman and the word maker is a very interesting word. It is the word which comes here, mean work, ergon. And it's also, this word is the word meaning the people. Otherwise, the people being worked, the, work, work, the people worked, being worked upon. 
Well, who's going to be doing the work? God's going to, this the people, the, the work of the people by God. And what work is that? It's the work he's doing in us. Otherwise, what's the city that's being built? We're like, we're really the city of God that's being built in us. For habitation, he's coming to dwell in us. And having the foundations, the foundations got to be laid. And who's doing it? The craftsman is the Lord building us. And he's the one who is working for the, doing the work in the people. Literally, it says, it's God accomplishing this great work. Because what's he going to bring us to? He's going to bring us all to the place where we are like him. And we've seen the total work of God done. And we come to the place of being one with him. And we are that glorious church. See, it's, we're going to come to that place. That, that's what this is talking about. Not a city, but the city. That's one specific city. It's nothing on earth, that's for sure. It's talking about what has the, fa the foundations where it's been built and the people maker, people worker, the, who does the work. Well, that's God doing the work and all of his people that are following after him. That's really what this is pointing towards. Another thing that we see, in other words, the point you want to see from this is we're in the earth. It's promised to by, for Jesus to retake it back, even though it belongs to the devil. It's not going to stay there for long. And you and I are going to see that this, is, this work is going to be done. God, who is building his work, he's going to bring us all to the place of perfection, being like him, because those ones who are the holy ones are going to be the ones who are going to be ruling and reigning in the coming millennial reign for a thousand years with him. We come to verse 11. So the point is, you've got to realize that even though you're in this earth, you're to be seeing the work of God be accomplished in you so that you will be ready for ruling and reigning in the millennial reign. Hebrews 11, 11, through faith also Sarah herself, wasn't just Abraham, but Sarah herself received, Lombano, took hold of power. She had to take hold of power. And that was simply to get the conception or the founding, the foundation, this word's translated foundation, the majority of times down here you can see, the foundation of the seed. Otherwise, she took hold of it, so the seed got planted in her. You're going to take hold of things, so God brings everything that whatever's to be put in you, gets planted in you, and it will start growing and start working. You're going to take hold of the power of God to bring your healing, power of God to bring forth everything, because you live by the power of God. Everything that God wants to bring forth. She took hold of it. And she was delivered of the child brought forth when she was past age. So this had nothing to do with physical. That all of a sudden God made her womb work. No, it had nothing to do with that. This is all supernatural, spiritual action that produced this child of promise, remember, because she judged him faithful who'd promised. This is a child of promise. God does things through promises supernaturally through the word of God in the realm of the spirit. And that's how you take hold of everything in your life through the Word of God coming into you. The spiritual power of God is producing everything. That's why you don't look at the natural. You take hold of things in the realm of the Spirit to bring things into being. She judged him faithful who had promised. Ah, that's what you and I, you must always know that God is faithful and because he promised, he absolutely will bring these things to pass. And then we come down to verse 13. It says, these all died in faith. Having, not having received the promises. Why? Because they couldn't come into being until the New Testament came into being. See, the promise wasn't through the law. The promise was through grace, remember, through faith. And that came through Jesus Christ for all the New Testament. Not having, having, but having seen them afar off, they knew about them. They were persuaded of them. They, they were believing about them and persuaded about all these promises. And they embraced them. They accepted them and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's another thing that you must realize. When it speaks about being strangers and pilgrims here on the earth, what's this talking about? The word strangers here, this word means foreigners, meaning you're a foreigner. Well, if you're a foreigner, that meant you, you don't belong to this place. You're not a, a, a normal 
homegrown one. You're a foreigner that's come from someplace else. And that's what we are, we're foreigners. But it also speaks of us as pilgrims. And pilgrims even define something else as one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there by the side of the natives. Where have you come from? Heaven, because you got a brand new spirit, because you were born from above, remember? It was a spiritual birth from above. When it says born again, we pointed this out, the word again means from above. The translation of again is deceiving. You don't have a born again like a physical birth again. A lot of people haven't figured it out. It should be born from above. Oh, that's a spiritual birth. That's a different from a physical birth. That's right. That's what the word means. And so you and I have been born from above, meaning where did your new spirit come from? From heaven, through birth. And now you have come to a foreign country. Remember, you are now an ambassador for Christ but you're not from this place at all. You're from heaven. You have a brand new spirit from heaven. You are a foreigner, a stranger in this place, foreigner, and you have come as one coming from heaven to carry out the, the work of God on the earth that he's called you to, as well as to overcome everything so you'll be ready for the rule and the reign of, in the new, new uh, millennial reign that'll be coming forth. You must understand, you are a foreigner and you have come from heaven. That's why we talk about you're citizens of heaven, not of this place. And you are to live as one who is a citizen of heaven. Well, he goes on and it says, they, seek, they say such things, declare plainly that they seek a country. Surely if they'd been mindful of that country and whence they came out, they would have had opportunity to have returned, but they're not looking for that one. They're looking for a better country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God. He's prepared for them a city. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, it says he offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Well, that shows you something. He was tried. Are you going to be tried and tested? Yeah, you're going to be tried and tested. You're going to have to pass the test. Well, how did he pass the test? He obeyed. He did what he told him to do. When you obey, that met, he met the conditions of him, what he needed to do, and then what happened? Because he was willing to give his son, that made it so God could give his son. He met the conditions so then the promise of giving Jesus could come to pass. He had to meet that condition in order to see that. He passed the test. And then we come down to verse 23 and we see something important. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And the king was going to kill him. They weren't afraid of the king's commandment. When the kings say they're going to kill everybody, don't be afraid of the king's commandments because God will deliver you if you believe and you trust in him. The angels will have charge over you to keep you and protect you in all your ways and they will show you the way of escape if you are walking in his ways, remember, in the end times. Don't be afraid of the king's commandment. You can't have any fear or, you're, you know, fear is not faith. Faith, you know, is operating in confidence and knowing what God will do. Fear is someone who doesn't know what he'll do and they don't believe the word of God. And furthermore, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That meant he's, you're not of this place. You're not under Pharaoh type of Satan. You're not, you're, not, you're not one of Satan's kids, you know, which is everybody in the world are. Remember, he's their spiritual father of everybody. It's only those that are born from above that are not under Satan's dominion. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What do we see? Everybody out in the world, they're enjoying the pleasures of sin, aren't they? Continually walking in it. What's going to happen when the Antichrist comes on the scene? We've already seen, because they're going to be well pleased with the unrighteousness. They're going to be pleased with the unrighteous. They're going to like the lawlessness. They're going to be in trouble. You have to take a stand always to do what is right. And you're not going to submit to anything when the Antichrist comes on the scene. And you're not about to fall for the pleasures of sin for a season, especially when the Antichrist says, there's no law. He's the lawless one. Unrighteousness is fine. You can do anything you want. No. 
You're not going to fall for that whatsoever. That is going to take you down. You've got to be like Moses who was not going to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in e Egypt. He had respect under the recompense of the reward. You've got to look, where's the reward? The reward is eternal life and being with the Lord. You don't compromise anything or you, it'll cost you your reward. No, we're not going to follow the pleasures of sin or any of these evil things. At the same time, you can't be afraid of the wrath of the king. By faith, he forsook Egypt. We've forsaken the world. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're not about to walk according to the ways of this world. Not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured. How are you going to endure? endure? How did he endure? As seeing him as invisible. Otherwise, he's, he's focused on the realm of the spirit according to the word of God. That's what you're going to do. You're going to walk in spirit according to the ways of the Word of God. That is absolutely essential. And then he says, Through faith he kept the Passover and sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Remember, they had to do this to be sure that they then were not destroyed in the judgment that was coming on Pharaoh in Egypt, remember. What's coming again? The judgment is going to come on the world. And if you have done what is necessary the Passover was eating the lamb, if you've taken Jesus, and if you got the blood of Jesus applied to you because you're walking in the light as he's in the light, you've met all the conditions, you'll be protected when the judgments come. That's what this is speaking of. The Passover was eating the type of us taking the lamb, which is Jesus in. They'd eat the lamb, remember? And the sprinkling of blood, well, they did, but that's all. How's the blood applied for you? When you walk in the light as he is in the light, that's when. Otherwise, it's not applied. We've talked about that in the past. So you won't be destroyed then if you meet the conditions. Verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by the dry land, which the Egyptians saying to do it were drowned. Well, the enemy was, uh, Pharaoh was after him, and they were pinned, looked like they were pinned up against, against the, the sea, you know. What are you going to do? You're going to be believing what God says, and he's going to do miraculous works to deliver you, including splitting a sea, whatever it might be, transporting you across a river. People have had that happen. Miraculous works, delivering you somehow. And they wanted to destroy them, but they, they, they came through victorious. Otherwise, you're going to know that God will deliver you miraculously, and there'll be a lot of miraculous deliveries that are going, deliverances that are going to come for people as we go down these last days. That is important to realize. And then as the judgment's coming, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Remember, we talked about out of Joshua 6, where the walls of Jericho come down, when they went around, remember there were the six days, is the type of the 6,000 years, and the seventh day, which is now the beginning, at the early morning, the beginning of the seventh, 7,000 year period, remember it was at the very daybreak, and then they went around, you know, and after they, and now the seven times, they were ready to blow that trumpet, and that's the seventh trumpet, and that's of course when, what happened, that's going to be the walls fell down, and the rapture occurs, and they went up, and they were victorious, of course, they went up and took the city, that's exactly what's going to happen again. It's going to be because you're walking by faith and you're obeying what he tells you to do. Look at this. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. You're going to have to do whatever needs to be done to do what's right in the face of any attacks or any repercussions from anybody out there in the world. God will deliver you. Rahab got delivered. You have to make sure you're doing what's right if you're going to be delivered. Everything we do is going to be with our faith. What shall I say more? It tells about all the different ones. Gideon, Barak, um, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And notice what they did with their faith. They subdued kingdoms. You got to realize your faith will do the same thing. If they could subdue kingdoms in the Old Testament, Surely we can uh, subdue anything that will come against us in the New Testament. They wrought righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. That means whatever's trying to come at you, you can stop the destruction coming at you. Your faith 
is the faith of Jesus that will bring total victory. You have to understand, quench the violence of fire. God can deliver you out of these type of things, absolutely. Escape the edge of the sword, they're coming after you. God will deliver you. If you have faith and you believe, they can come and get you. God can just transport you right out of there. Where'd he go? <laughs> God took care of you, got you out of there, delivered you from it. Out of weakness, were made strong, became strong. Waxed valiant, strong and mighty in war and fight and battle. Spiritual battle, remember, not natural. You're going to be able to prevail against the devils coming against you. you can, this is what your faith will do now, and this is what your faith will do all the way, all the days of your life, as long as you're in faith. That's why your faith has to grow exceedingly and become strong and mighty. If your faith cannot get the victory now, you're going to be in trouble. Because when the next things happen down the road, if you can't conquer the enemy now, you think you're going to conquer when things are really ramped up and the greatest pressure's coming that's ever been? You got to get your faith working now and conquer everything. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. They're coming after me. Well, they left. They went another way. <laughs> they got turned away. Because you spoke to them, you bound those devils and commanded them to be removed. You have dominion. These are tremendous things. This all happened through their faith. God is a God who will respond. Notice this, even women receive their dead raised to life again. The dead will be raised, remember. Just as it happened in the first church, it's going to happen again with a greater glory in the end time, remember. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They might obtain a better resurrection. For one thing, you only want the, one, you want the first resurrection, the right resurrection, which is getting the glorified body and being with the Lord. You're never going to compromise anything. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. God can deliver you out of anything. Look what happened to Paul and Silas. The prison doors opened. What were they doing? Were they crying in, in the corner? No, they were preaching the gospel. They were praising God and praying and preaching the gospel. And he, the jailer, you know, he heard it. And, oh, he says, falls down. What must I do to be saved? You know? Oh, that means you're doing what God wants. You're not compromising. You've got to get committed that you're going to do what God says. Always. That's it. You're going to always follow what he wants you to do. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, slain with a sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Well, they went through a lot. Certainly, the promises of God are always remember. And if the angels will have charge over you to keep you in all your ways, they'll have charge over you to keep you all your ways if you meet all the conditions. You've got to understand that whom the world was not worthy, wandered in deserts, mountains, dens, caves of the earth. These all have not obtained the good report through faith, received not the promise. They didn't get the promise because you couldn't get it till the New Testament came into being, see. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us, because they couldn't be until the New Testament came into being, not that they should not be made perfect, might not be made perfect because the condition had to be met, which was the New Testament had to come into being. But also knows what it said. Notice what it says: they without us should not should might not become perfect. Well, that means they were supposed to become perfect. That's right, because you're to become perfect just as well. They couldn't become perfect. They can only be accounted as righteous. But you can become perfect because we can go on to perfection in the New Testament and become like Jesus and like the Father. That's the promise. The great promise that you and I are going to become perfect and we're going to become like Jesus and we're going to have eternal life and we're going to get the glorified body and we're going to be with the Lord and we're going to rule and reign and we're going to enter into his spiritual rest. We're going to see the complete work accomplished. And it's all because of your faith. You've got to meet every one of these conditions for your faith to operate and see these things.
Before we move on, just comment, comment on these conditions, these ones. You need the precise, correct knowledge of God. You got to put it in active and oper oper operation effectively. You got to put your spirit of faith in operation as you get the specific faith through hearing the word. You're going to have faith and long suffering as you're inheriting the promises. You're going to have most certain confidence with a true heart. You're going to be holding fast your confession, unmoved, not wavering, firm, nothing shaking you. You're going to be living by faith and putting your faith in operation to preserve your soul so it doesn't get contaminated and destroyed. You're going to have the underlying reality and firm guarantee of what you're hoping for because that's what your faith will produce. You have the proof, certainty, and assurance of things not seen. You're going to take hold of everything that's not seen. You're operating in the spirit. You get moved by the natural, you just, flow, you just went down. You can't be moved by what's seen. It's, you're going to be witnessed and testified that, just like those elders were, you're going to be witnessed and testified that, yeah, that's a person of faith. You're going to be perceiving with the mind everything was prepared, arranged, all the ages, put in order, completeness and perfection by the spoken word of God. The same thing's going to happen for you. Everything's going to be prepared, arranged, and put in order and bring you to completeness and perfection because you're going to speak the word. Just like God spoke the word, you're going to speak the word and bring these things into being. You're going to be righteous because you're going to be a tither and you're going to be a doer of the word of righteousness. Otherwise, you're in trouble. You're going to be well-pleasing to God because you're going to keep the commandments and walk in His ways. You're going to believe, of course, that He is, and you know He's going to be a rewarder of those because you're going to be seeking Him continually, and you're going to get the rewards. You're going to be warned of God concerning the things not seen, and that's going to move you. You're not going to be moved, but you're going to do what needs to be done. You're going to make sure you have the fear of the Lord. You're preparing and making your vessel, the spiritual house, for you and your house to be saved. You're going to condemn the world, and you're going to walk in the ways of faith and see your inheritance come to pass. You're going to receive the call of God and obey the call to go forth and possess your inheritance, not, just like he was, not knowing where he's going, but he's going to obey it anyway. So you've got to obey the call of God. You've got to understand you're in the earth of promise. What's the promise? That it's going to be retaken by Jesus, and you're going to see it come to pass if you are right with him. And remember, this earth is belonging to Satan, belonging to another, as it said. And you're dwelling here in these temporary dwelling places of this physical body. And you have the same promise as everybody else has, that God's going to retake the earth. And you're going to enter into becoming like him and be ruling and reigning and over the earth. We're going to be here, remember. The whole topography is going to be changed, but we are going to be here ruling and reigning with Jesus we also see we're going to be looking for this tremendous work of Jesus to be accomplished in us to bring us to the place of becoming like him, that that total work will be accomplished. We're going to be taking hold of the power of God for everything is that seeds planted into us and we hear it and do it and work it continually. Every promise is coming to pass. It all starts with a seed getting the word in you and you do it and you take hold of that in order to bring it all, everything into manifestation, because you know he's faithful that promised. This is why you take the word, you take all of it, you believe it, you speak it, you start doing it, and work it continually, and hold fast to it. It'll all come to pass. They were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed, but they never could possess it, but you will be able to. We are foreigners in the earth, and pilgrims that come from a foreign country. We're born from above, we're citizens of heaven. You and I are, when it talked about seeking a country, by the way, that word there means fatherland. We're seeking the fatherland, which will be by the Father, the one that the Father is controlling through Jesus Christ. Also, we pass the test by obeying like Abraham did. We're not going to be afraid of the king's commandments, whatever evil stuff that they are going to throw out, and it will be evil, you know it. We're going to refuse the things of the world, the pleasures of sin. Our eyes are on the reward. We're not about to get deceived by anything of the world or anything of sin. We're not going to fear the wrath of the king when they're threatening you with all these things. We're going to obey so we don't get destroyed at the time of the judgment. We're going to be delivered from the attacks of the end of the enemy miraculously, regardless of what needs to be done, whether it's transporting you, delivering you, 
blinding the eyes of the enemies coming at you, <laughs> whatever it might be, shutting the mouths of lions, whatever, turning to flight the aliens, our armies coming at you. This happened to these guys in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. You have the faith of Jesus, <laughs> delivered from all those attacks, being ready that, uh, for the rapture and being met the conditions like Rahab, Rahab did. So the judgment will not come on her. She was saved. She was right. And all to see the tremendous miracles of victory because we're going to see the promise. And what's that promise? That we come to the place of perfection to have eternal life. And that's where you and I are headed. Every single one of us are going to come to that place as we do what he says. There's tremendous things that here in the faith chapter. It shows you all the different principles that need to be carried out, as well as the rest of the scriptures. We're going to learn to speak things into being. We're not going to fall for these lying doctrines that you speak one time and then think it's going to be God's going to do it. No, we're going to keep speaking to the mountain. We're going to keep casting out the demons. We're going to keep holding fast our confession. We're going to keep speaking these things into being. We're going to keep doing what God says in order to see all the results come to pass. We're going to use our faith to conquer everything. You have the faith of Jesus that will bring total victory. Your faith to grow exceedingly. You cannot let yourself get weak in faith. Remember what it talks about. We'll just look at these scriptures before we close. Romans 4 about Abraham's faith. It was the God kind of faith. Or Saul, he's calling those things not being as being, to bring them into being. He continually spoke them into being. That's what you do. That's what God does. Against hope, believed in hope. It doesn't matter what the circumstance is. You have a promise. You're going to speak against any confident expectancy. You believe in that confident expectancy. God's promises are sure and set. He watches over his word to perform it. And it was that he might become the father of many nations. And, of course, being not weak in faith. How would you get weak in faith if you start considering anything in the natural? You consider your own body, you consider your feelings, you consider what's going on in the natural, your circumstances. You're not going to do it. You're going to consider what God says and you're going to put him in operation doing what he says. He's 100 years old, the deadness in Sarah's womb. Remember, it had nothing to do with anything in the physical. It was all the promise coming to pass. Stagger not at the promise of God through any unbelief. You're not going to stagger. You're going to always be a believer. Remember, you must believe continually and never allow doubt or unbelief to get a hold of you. It will take you down for sure. But he was strong, empowered in faith, <clears throat> empowered within, in dunamo, giving glory to God. And he was fully persuaded that what he'd promised he was able to perform. That's a covenant statement. You've got to be fully persuaded. Every promise that God said he's able to perform, not only is he able to perform it, he swore by himself that he'd perform it. He's going to, he's a, he watches over his word to perform it. It's covenant. It's all about covenant. You have a covenant with God. You've got to have a covenant mindset. You've got to be thinking covenant when you're functioning in whatever you're doing. You're going to do what, you, what the promise is, or excuse me, what the condition is. You've got to meet those conditions. God's not going to wink his eye at you and, and just pass over you if you don't meet the conditions. If you haven't met the conditions, you shut him down so he can't accomplish things. You can limit him. They limited the Holy One of Israel because they didn't do, meet the conditions. If you meet the conditions, though, God will bring you through, and he'll bring you through anything and everything at any point in time in your life. God wants you to be blessed, but you've got to understand your faith is what's going to bring you through. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, your faith shouldn't fail ever, but it could fail. We should point this out. Luke 18. This is where we see where when it says, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? What's that mean? Well, they're the only ones that are going to be victorious. If you're not in faith, you're going to probably be defeated, wiped out, martyred out, whatever happened, fallen away if you're not operating in faith. He's going to be looking for faith. That's what has to happen. He's going to look for finding faith on the earth. And also, 
we see also. Satan demands you. That's what it literally says. Satan has demanded not to have. There's no to have there. It literally says he demanded you. And when it says he demanded you, it's for himself. Why do you say that? Because it's a middle voice. He demanded you, himself, for himself, because he wants to destroy you. Remember, the thief cometh not, but he might kill, might destroy, might, might steal, kill, and destroy, if you let him, that he may sift you, which means to try to overthrow your faith. You can't let your faith be overthrown. You've got to get your faith strong. You can't be weak in faith by considering anything in the natural. You've got to get your faith strong because you're so word-oriented. You know the word. You think the word. You have the precise, correct knowledge of God. You're putting your faith in operation. You're long-suffering. You're going to be steadfast, which is another thing we'll be talking about. All these things are critical. He said, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Does that mean it couldn't fail? No. This is subjunctive mood. That your faith may not fail. You got the faith of Jesus and your faith could fail? That's right. If you let doubt or unbelief or you don't work it or you have sin in the camp or you're not righteous or you get afraid of the attacks or you're not, do, not speaking the word or you believe some lying doctrine that tells you to speak one time and not do anything more and you don't know how to operate your faith properly, no, you got to be on the mark. And God's Word tells us exactly what to do. Your faith will not fail if you do what so. Jesus prayed for him that your faith might not fail. Well, Jesus' prayers get results if you meet the conditions. Your faith won't fail. Remember, your faith will bring forth everything that you have need of. That's why we're commanded to walk by faith and not by sight. Then when you're converted, he said, strengthen the brethren. So your faith is going to give you victory. And so we've seen more about conditions, especially in regards to faith tonight, as we've seen in this also, many of those ones in Hebrews is showing us the fact that this is all prophetic also, has prophetic implications. Because remember, how do we know the end from the beginning, don't we? What happened formerly, it's going to happen again. We've seen that. All you see that happened in the past it's going to happen again. Well, that means the same things that they're going to try, came against them are going to happen again. But if they overcame and conquered everything, it's going to happen again for those who operate in faith. That's you and me. So, get your faith working. Correct everything. That's why Paul went and said he came to, to correct that, what was lacking in their faith. Anything lacking in your faith, it needs to get corrected. So we come in line. You start operating, you're going to operate according to the Word. You're going to put your faith in operation. And remember, it's not just, I'm believing God to do such and such. Well, that means you have faith, but it's not doing anything. Remember, faith without works is dead, doing nothing. You have to work your faith. You work your faith by speaking, by doing, by acting continually on what the Word says until you see the results. And you will always see it come to pass as you work your faith. Say this, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the conditions that are necessary for the God kind of faith that will bring total victory, conquer all enemies, bring me through anything and everything that the enemy would bring against me. I understand. I have the faith of Jesus and I get specific faith through the Word of God. And my faith is to grow exceedingly. And as I get the Word of God and I mix it with my general spirit of faith, my faith will be working. And I will continually put it in operation to possess every promise. No promise will come short in my life. I'm possessing them all. And I thank you that just as God spoke things into being, I will speak things into being to bring every promise into manifestation. I will hold fast the profession of my hope and I will be firm. I will never waver. I will never draw back. 
I will always operate by faith. In the unseen realm, taking hold of every promise, speaking the word, putting God in operation to see him perform all the word of promise in my life. And I will go on to perfection. I will become like Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You've given me a spirit of faith, the faith of Jesus Christ that will bring total victory. I will see my faith get strong and I will always work my faith, which will bring all the promises to pass. Because when I meet the conditions for the God kind of faith, you will perform every promise in my life. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. That certainly is an important condition for a covenant. You know, many people, they, they just have, they hope, you know, I'm hoping, I'm praying and hoping, or I'm believing, and they never see anything. Or they haven't known what they needed to do in applying their faith or work in some way. Or they worked it for a short time and then they threw in the towel instead of continued. You've got to be long-suffering. You've got to be steadfast on the Word and working it continually. That's how you're going to see victory come forth in your life. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We'll be hearers and doers of this word. Meet the conditions shown forth for having the true faith so you bring all the promises to pass. And thank you that our faith will not fail because we will have the true God kind of faith and work it and see the results. Father, thank you for all you accomplish as we're hearers and doers of the word, walking by faith not by sight, and working it continually to see you accomplish everything in our life. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I trust.